evening, Peter. Good evening, everyone. Very good to see you all um, here again, and good to welcome some new faces um, as well. One of the, the beauties, I think, of, of this um, journey through Lent is that you can, you can come and go in, in the sense that you don't have to have attended all the sessions to make sense of, of what we're doing. So it's good, um, it's good to welcome new people, and uh, equally those who aren't able to be here, if they do come back, then that's fine too, but welcome, welcome everyone. As I was reflecting on our time together last week um, about the Emmaus Road and the ways in which I was reflecting on the disciples there, kind of journeying um, in shadows and light, as I was reflecting on that and thinking ahead to this week um, about the parables, it became apparent to me that I couldn't really make sense of the parables, those stories that Jesus told, without in a sense reflecting um, on the topic of discipleship and identity, particularly because the passage that I flagged for um, our focus this week, Mark chapter 4, which of course contains quite a few parables, right at the end of that chapter um, is the incident of the calming of the storm where Jesus' identity really becomes a hot topic. So following the parables, we get quite an interesting reflection on who Jesus is and who Jesus might be. So. My reflections this evening are going to, I suppose, mirror that sense of journeying on the Emmaus Road um, with the topic of discipleship um, and the identity of the disciples in following Jesus, but also thinking about what sort of person Jesus was that made people follow him. And with that, uh, we'll be reflecting on shadows and light as we go along, because that's the thread that's leading us through this season of Lent. Now that, um, you might be wondering what that picture or that photograph is that I have on, on the slide here. Um, this is in fact a photograph uh, looking up at the sky and it was taken in uh, the Art Museum, the, the National Art Gallery in Canberra um, in Australia and it's an art installation um, outside the, the Art Gallery uh, where you're invited to, to walk into it um, and an aspect of it involves just simply sitting in a kind of like a cocoon looking upwards at the light and at different points in the day the light takes on different aspects and different shadows um, emerge so this was kind of um, twilight uh, later in the day when the shadows made the whole interior of it quite dark but upwards um, there was a clear sense of, of sky. Um, and sometimes I wonder with the parables that it's a, a question of wondering what they're about and which direction they're going in. And getting to the end of it, we are encouraged almost to look up to the sky and try and get that sense of clarity of what the parable is. Um, I've chosen as a focus Mark chapter 4, and Mark's gospel as a whole really gives us quite an interesting way into thinking about parables and issues of discipleship and identity. One of the first things that strikes you about Mark's gospel is the way in which the whole story is told with great urgency and pace. Um, if you read through Mark's Gospel, you'll notice that we have a lot of references to things happening immediately. So the Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness, and immediately he called them, and immediately on the Sabbath he entered the synagogue and taught, and immediately the leprosy left him. In fact, that word immediately is used um, over 40 times in Mark's Gospel. So that sense of pace and urgency and energy is, is really quite important to Mark as he crafts his story. It's almost like it gives us frequent flashes of light. So we get a lot of light coming into the narrative of Mark's Gospel in a way that's at times quite overwhelming, quite clarifying in some ways to the whole sense of the narrative. Now, if I asked you the question, well, what is a gospel? I wonder how you might respond. What are some answers that you might give to that question? What is a gospel? Imagine a visitor from Mars arrives, and the first thing that visitor from Mars asks you, that may seem unlikely, they ask you, what is a gospel? It's good news. 
Yeah, it's a story of good news, isn't it? There's a story element in it. That's right, it's the story of good news. That's, that's an important sense, so it has a sense of narrative about it. The record of the historical past. Yes, so it's... So it's uh, um, a, a telling of the events of Jesus' life and, and ministry. It's a record of those events, if you like, recorded, written down, narrated, passed down for a, for a particular intention. A message of liberation? Yes, a message of liberation. Your mind reading me. <laughs> Here's the first thing I've got. Um, it's a message that's expected, really, to transform the life of the hearer. It's meant, in some ways, to be transformative. And in lots of ways, I think the parables are messages that are somehow expected to transform the life of the hearer. Discipleship as a theme is really important for Mark. That question, how did we get here, and what does it mean? The parables, I think, are part of that answer, helping us to understand how we arrived at this point and what it all might mean. Mark writes because of relationship. So Mark is not writing in a vacuum, in isolation. Mark is writing because of a relationship he has with his hearers and with his community. He is aware of the shadows and the light in his community, and he aims to tell them the good news in order to bring hope and transformation to the story of their lives. The American poet Emily Dickinson, has anybody heard of Emily Dickinson?
Mark's Gospel to give you a sense of where this parable's chapter, chapter 4, fits. So Jesus appears preaching God's rule. Jesus then ministers in Galilee. Quite a large section of Mark's Gospel is left to that. So the parable's chapter of chapter 4 um, constitutes that part of ministry. Um, then we get a couple of chapters on Jesus and the disciples' mission. Um, and then most of Mark's Gospel is taken up with the events leading to Jesus' crucifixion um, and resurrection. Although the resurrection, as we'll see, just gets something of a momentary glimpse in the Gospel. Much of Mark's Gospel is taken up with the Passion narrative, which makes it almost um, a Lenten journey in and of itself, which is quite interesting. Um, another briefer summary might be simply to say that it starts by asking the question, who is this man? And secondly, why will Jesus die? So who is this man and why will Jesus die? Some of the key themes in Mark's Gospel, the parables fit into, can be described as follows. Firstly, there's quite a lot of secrecy in Mark's Gospel, which has always fascinated um, readers of the Gospel for, for many, many years, especially in the earlier chapters of Mark's Gospel. Jesus keeps telling people to be quiet, not to say anything. And the parables are kind of part of this strategy, particularly coming in chapter 4. The second big theme is this theme of identity. Who is Jesus? <coughs> son of God, Son of Man, Servant of God. Lots of titles get used in Mark's Gospel. Thirdly, the idea of Mark's Gospel, as I've just hinted at, being a lifelong passion. Um, our discipleship journey is very much um, a lifelong journey of following Christ to the cross and to the resurrection. This is a really important aspect of how Mark tells his story. And then the theme of discipleship, which echoes calling and following, missioning and sending, instructions. Importantly, failures. The disciples don't get things right all of the time. There's often a failure to understand. So if we listen to a parable, and we don't quite understand it. That's actually part of how the gospel story invites us to delve deeper and to keep learning more. And Mark's portrayal, I think, if in that, is ultimately encouraging. We, like the disciples, are humans too. And uh, I'll be saying a little bit more about that um, in our session next week when I talk about the Apostle Paul. So, secrecy. Now, um, this is an illustration, of course, from the parable um, of the sower, which is the parable of focus in chapter 4. Um, but there's this rather curious aspect to the parable. To you has been given the secret of the kingdom of God. But for those outside, everything comes in parables. To you has been given the secret of the kingdom of God. But for those outside, everything comes in parables. Now that's a bit of an interesting aspect to this story, isn't it? Because it's almost as if we're being told um, that actually some people have got the secret of the kingdom of God, um, but most just simply have to sit and listen and work with the parables, the way in which the kingdom is revealed to us through parables. So what are the parables about? What are they for? The parables, um, they're accessible. I think that's the first important thing to say about them. They're drawn, really, from illustrations from, from daily life. Um, the word parable is uh, derived from a Greek word, uh, parabole, which means the placing of two things side by side for the sake of comparison. So in this sense, actually, um, almost all of Jesus' teaching can in some way be called parabolic, or a type of parable, explaining, for example, what the kingdom of God is like. 
So strictly the word parable should be used of sayings that begin, the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven is like dot, dot, dot. But often the word parable is applied a lot more freely, um, even to stories that offer, for example, um, aspects of how we are to live, such as the parable of the Good Samaritan from Luke's Gospel and the parable of the Faithful Steward and a number of other parables um, that you can probably think of. Strictly speaking, they're not parables and yet we call them parables. Are you with me? So the word parable actually applies to a lot more than simply the strict interpretation of that word meaning the placing of two things side by side, which is technically what the word parable um, is about. What's the purpose of the parables? Well, I've touched a little bit um, on that already, I suppose, but Jesus told parables in different contexts and for lots of different reasons. Um, in his conflict with some Pharisees, for example, Jesus challenged the way in which he perceived they were being complacent and opposed to him. Surrounded by often a lot of controversy, Jesus explained his authority and his actions. So through his parables, Jesus then gives understanding, his understanding of God's kingdom. And he urges his listeners with that towards repentance. In the Gospels, um, the word parable is often used to describe um, like a proverb and a comparison, as I've just touched on. Um, and it's used for both simple stories and perhaps more complicated stories. In Matthew's Gospel, in chapter 13, which is another chapter that we get lots of parables in, um, one of my favourite parts of that um, chapter comes right near the end, I think it's verse 53, where Jesus tells lots of parables and then says to his disciples, have you understood all this? And we are told that they reply in unison, yes. Now, I kind of wonder actually what sort of yes the disciples actually used at that point. You know, was it a kind of emphatic, yes, of course we understand everything that you're saying? Or was it a more tentative, yes? And with that, was it a, well, we better say yes, because if we say no or not really, that could get us into either hot water or could invite another 20 chapters of explanation, which we can't possibly deal with at the moment. So there's something about the telling of the story, the telling of the parable, and the receiving of it. Um, what do we feel like when we are in church, for example, and simply hear a parable proclaimed as the gospel? Um, it's then up to the preacher to, of course, explain and unpack everything that it means. Um, but sometimes I wonder what, what would it be like at that point in the service to enter into a conversation about what that parable is like. And I can hear lots of cries that that's not particularly Anglican. <laughs> I don't really want to get into a conversation at that point because it could get a bit unwieldy. Um, that's for the Bible study group that meet on a Wednesday evening at 7.30. That kind of thing. <laughs> anyway. Um, parables are stories of concealing and revealing, stories of shadow, stories of light, stories that are really ultimately about our journey of discipleship and our understanding of what the kingdom of God is. Parables um, are also um, a lot to do with teaching. So they're often put into different groups according to what sort of style or form that they appear in. Um, you sometimes get stories that are comparisons, um, example stories that offer positive or negative models and lead to the statement, go and do, or go and do likewise. Um, and some parables offer kind of extended pictures of things like the banquet, the parable of the banquet, and others are allegorical, offering series of related metaphors, such as the story or the parables were sometimes told of the sheep and the goats. Jesus' parables, however, do concentrate on the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven. Matthew's very keen on the kingdom of heaven, um, either as it is at present or as it is yet to come. 
that's part of that narrative technique that Mark uses about past, present and future. Other common themes that link into the parables are the themes of discipleship, of prayer and the right use of possessions. It can be said that Jesus has vivid parables because many of them are really vivid. Um, they capture the attention of people, they challenge presumptions and they invite audiences to see reality from a different perspective and they invite audiences to reflect further. So much like that picture at the beginning of sitting in the shadow looking up the light, there's an encouragement in the parables to look up and around, to see things from a different perspective, usually ordinary things that we encounter every day. And this, in a sense, is linked to the Lenten journey towards the cross and towards the resurrection. It's particularly relevant, I think, to Mark's Gospel. Now, I could do a whole lecture on the ending of Mark's Gospel, which I'm not going to do now, but suffice to say that there are some questions about where exactly Mark's Gospel finishes. If you open your New Testament and go to the end of Mark's Gospel, you will see that there are different endings suggested for it. And this is because um, the earliest manuscript copy of Mark's Gospel that we have um, finishes, it seems, quite abruptly at chapter 16, verse 8. And so there are some later endings that have appeared. And the question is, well, where is the ending meant to be? Is it the case that a theologically keen Easter bunny has nibbled at the manuscript at a particular point and has left us with what we have? Um, or did Mark really mean to end his gospel in chapter 16, and verse 8, with the women at the tomb apparently saying nothing to anyone and sort of shivering in their sandals? So we are led to believe. Um, but actually, I think that the clue in the ending of Mark's Gospel, if it is at verse 8, is that sense of it's not a full stop, but it's a dot, dot, dot. It's an invitation for us to re-engage with the start of the Gospel and to reread the whole of that Gospel in the light of the resurrection, to reread the parables in the light of the reality of the resurrection. What difference does that make to your journey as a disciple? if you can actually reread and re-encounter the narrative with a sense of the cross and the resurrection at its heart. It's a bit of interactive. Uh, <laughs> did, you, did you see that? Yeah. 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 Just one more time. <laughs> just, in case, just in case you need that 8pm um, lift. <laughs> So in that sense, the story of the parables and the gospel and the story of Lent, the story
in the
they're actually proclaiming the gospel. Um, I'm sure that's not their intention, um, but nonetheless it offers us an opportunity to actually work with that. With the Easter bunny and the other Easter things, but the use of that word Easter, the fact that it's all around us, it offers us an opportunity to think creatively about how we can allow the story to become the story, if you see what I mean. But that's a real challenge. It's a real challenge. But I like to think of it not as a challenge so much as an opportunity to engage. The challenges of Mark's discipleship theme are to let ourselves be addressed by Jesus, by the storyteller, Mark, because Mark is writing because he has a relationship with Christ and with his community, as we do. And with that, the importance of grasping and sharing in the changed state of affairs that this good news testifies to. Because that's what the beginning of Mark's Gospel is all about. It's a bold headline that things are different. <clears throat> things are different because God became human in the form of Jesus Christ. The incarnation is the very thing that breaks into our world and transforms everything. So in that sense, Jesus is the Jesus of testimony. Peter plays a really important role as eyewitness in Mark's Gospel. And there's a deeper level too at which Peter is the central figure of the Gospel. Mark's Peter is not a kind of chief super apostle. In many ways, he's a typical witness and a typical hero of Jesus because Peter gets it wrong too. Jesus proclaims, I am. Peter says, I'm not not one of those followers that follows Jesus. Peter is apostle, Peter is witness, Peter is church, Peter actually is us. Because if the gospel is for Peter, then surely it is for each one of us. Peter lurks in the shadows and denies the very existence and meaning of Christ in his life. And sometimes I think, we can do that too, whether intentionally or unintentionally, when sometimes it becomes very hard to follow Christ. We sometimes, I think, can live in the shadows. So we might reflect, each one of us, where we are, where we are, and where the hope lies. Because if we can articulate what it means to follow Jesus, and that can transform everything. Here's Jesus speaking to the young gentleman who, uh, those of you who know Twitter, when if you're on Twitter, you can choose to follow somebody. Um, I get a message occasionally saying, um, Easter Bunny has requested to follow you on Twitter. The question is, do I allow Easter Bunny to follow me? Or do I decline Easter Bunny's request? But anyway, the point is that uh, following Jesus is not simply a matter of clicking on a button and signing up to a social media networking site. Um, it requires more involvement, more entering into the drama of the story, more encountering Christ in the everydayness of everyday life, which is exactly how the parables work, taking ordinary objects and transforming them in their meaning so that we can enter into the life and the vibrancy of the Kingdom of God. I'm going to take a pause at that point and have some uh, refreshments, and then we can come back for a little bit um, of reflection and discussion, um, particularly on chapter four of Mark's Gospel. Is that all right? We've just, we just got a brief, a brief time, really, for some discussion and reflection, but... Um, Yesterday, I, um, yesterday morning, I uh, paid a visit to Subble School, so I spent the morning um, at, at Subble, and um, part of that involved uh, going to a couple of classes, and uh, it was the Year 3s, um, 
And just before the second class, uh, Neil, who's the chaplain, got a phone call and he had to attend to um, a pastoral situation. So um, he sort of looked at me and I said, Look, do you want me to teach the class? And he went, oh, that would be fantastic. <laughs> so off he went, <laughs> leaving me with 40 minutes with a, a glass full of year threes. And I thought, oh, crikey. So I did what I do know best, really, which is just kind of, um, as my husband would call it, whip up a storm and then leave it for the teachers to sort out. But, <laughs> um, but, it, but it reminded me of the importance of storytelling and how we do that in an interactive way. So I was doing, the, they were doing the story of Cain and Abel. Um, I must say it was the it was the sort of more positive side of the relationship between Cain and Abel. We didn't get to the you know other bit, but um, we focused on their occupations. So with 40 minutes and a need to fill time, I had everyone doing different sorts of sheep impressions, and then lots of impressions of grains of wheat. You know, who can tell me how to do an impression of a grain of wheat? I thought that would box them for five minutes, but <laughs> so. Um, Okay, so, um, but it kind of reminded me actually of, of the power of storytelling um, and the way in which particularly um, children receive stories and interact with them in a way that kind of takes them at the face value, if you see what I mean? Um, there's no need to explain, it's just let's just encounter this story um, and see where we go with it. And in some ways, I think the parables kind of work like that. They tell a story, and on one level, we're simply meant to, to listen to it, to absorb it, to, to interact with it, to, if you like, even recreate or reimagine what it might be like in our own context. So um, when I was a student, I lived in a house with other um, students for a couple of years, and the house had a, a part of the, the stairwell area, it was quite dark, it had, didn't have any natural light, and there was a plant um, there. And I um, watered this plant, um, and I thought, I was quite pleased with myself, because I have a, I have a history of demolishing house plants, really. Um, but this plant thrived, and I was quite impressed, really, until um, it was revealed to me after about a term that, in fact, it was a plastic. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know where the water was going, but um, <laughs> um, it sort of, I thought, oh, this, you know, it's, the seed is falling on good ground, and the plant is, is, is growing, and actually it wasn't a plant at all. But, um, um, but Phil, um, I spoke to Phil just a moment ago, you had quite an interesting uh, retelling of that. Phil do, you want to, Phil, do you want to come up here and just share that contemporary illustration of the part of the sower? Because I thought, yeah, that's actually really, that's really good. It was, it was just something I did uh, a few years ago now. I, the uh, gospel for the day was on the parable of the sower and I needed an illustration. And it's, it's really difficult to find good illustrations about the parable of the sower. So I thought, I know what I'll do. I'll rewrite the parable in a contemporary setting. So I just had, wrote this little story about a um, farmer with a great big tractor coming along the road and, his eye, and he was had the um, hopper loaded with corn and he was going to sow corn out on the field but somehow or other the engine of the sowing me mechanism had got engaged and so he's driving along towards me and I'm seeing this great spray of corn seed going everywhere and of course some is landing on the good ground and some is landing on the verge where the, the puha grows and some is landing on the road where it's never going to grow at all and of course the birds are crowding down eating all the seed, and I thought to myself, what would I do if I saw a farmer coming at me like that? I want to flag him down and say, hey, 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 your machinery's going. And then I realised, good grief, that's what we're supposed to think about God, who throws his grace everywhere. It doesn't matter whether it's landing on the road or not, he just distributes it, distributes it freely to all. And then, of course, at the end, I thought, aha. Uh -huh. That's why they call it the parable of the sower and not the parable of the soils. <laughs> thanks, thanks for that, Phil. It's, it's true, but if you, you know, if you went out into the street and saw that happening um, on the road, you'd think, oh, what's going on? Um, any other, um, we don't have to talk exclusively about Mark 4, but just in, in, in the few minutes left that, that we've got, any other any reflections or, or, or questions or thoughts that you'd like to share about how
parables or the, the sense of story and identity and discipleship. Yes. I had a question for mm. you because I've yeah. been studying the lion, the eagle, the man, the ox, which stands for courageous, visionary, compassionate service. And of course, Matthew is about the kingdom, okay? Mm -hmm. The eagle is John, I believe, mm -hmm. and the man is Luke, but Mark is the ox. Now, you talk about Mark sort of defining things in terms of the victory, the power, and then the cross. How are these different ones, like um, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, how do they, what's the relationship between them in terms of their vision of Christ, <coughs> what they're writing, and also Mark in the book of Acts, is that the same Mark who walked with Paul, or where, where does Mark disappear to in the book of Acts? Gosh, there's a lot of questions. <laughs> um, I think you know, in brief, because I could probably do a whole other series on the Gospels, actually. Yeah, there is this, uh, there is clearly a relationship between Matthew, Mark and Luke. Um, they're often known as synoptic Gospels, which is a word that means seen with one gaze. So we often have Matthew, Mark and Luke, and then we kind of have John sort of here doing something apparently a bit different. Actually, I think all the Gospels um, are seeing the same things, but from slightly different perspectives, and together they, they make up um, a whole. So it, it's difficult to just isolate one gospel without a sense of what the other gospels are doing with that material. I mean, clearly Mark, Matthew and Luke have some kind of literary relationship. Um, John um, probably has awareness of this, but um, carefully crafts his narrative to, to point to some very deeper truths about who who Jesus is. So um, the Gospels are working working together, although they're written in, in, in different different contexts by, by, by different authors. Um, but there's a real sense, um, uh, particularly in, in more recent New Testament scholarship of uh, the Gospel writers as attending to eyewitness testimony. Um, and, and testimony is the kind of telling of events, but also a sense of interpretation of what those um, events are. Now, where um, was Mark in the book of well, it could be the Mark in Acts is, or the John Mark is, is, is the Mark, who's, who's the Gospel author. Um, it, it could be. We don't, I don't know con conclusively the answer um, to that, but clearly he, uh, there is a Mark who's a character in Acts who comes and goes um, a bit. So, yep.
challenging way, the story of, of shadows and, and light. Um, so I'll spend some time with you next week taking you through um, Paul's life and some of his, his letters. Very difficult actually to do justice to Paul in one evening, but um, perhaps that might give us scope for some more, some more sessions on Paul at some point. So I'll just finish with, with a prayer. Gracious God, sometimes we walk through the shadows, but we know that your light is always there to sustain us, to enfold us, and to encourage us. Grant, O oh Lord, that by the indwelling of your Holy Spirit, we may be enlightened and strengthened for your service. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Let's say the words of the grace <clears throat> together. Grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, be with us all.